Well, ladies and gentlemen, for the last of our panels, we have three more of America's greatest First Amendment heroes. I'm just so excited to uh, be in conversation with them. And we're going to talk about uh, free speech on campus. Um, and uh, Will uh, Creeley from FIRE and Nadine Strosen from NYU, from, from New York Law School, and uh, Jeannie Sue Gerson from Harvard Law School have been such clarion voices in America for uh, defending free speech on campus. And Will Creeley, let's uh, start with you. So in the Mahoney case in uh, 2021, uh, uh, Justice Breyer, for eight justices, held that a cheerleader can curse on Snapchat. Uh, and he upheld the standard from the Tinker case that you can't ban speech unless it's uh, likely to cause material disruption or substantially invade the rights of others. There have been a bunch of lower court cases since then. Fire is uh, involved in some of them. And lower courts are divided about whether or not campus speech meets the Mahoney standard. Tell us about the debate on the lower court and, 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 and where the flashpoints are. Well, well, thanks, Jeff. You know, it's hard to back clean up here because there's been so much uh, excellent conversation already. It's an honor. Uh, I want to weigh into things that everybody else on the other panel said. So I will answer your question with a little bit of an answer to uh, Bruce's excellent moderation in the previous panel. Part of the job of folks who give a damn about the First Amendment uh, and as the legal director for FIRE, I certainly lead a team of those folks, and it's my honor to do so, is to appeal to self-interest. And when I'm talking to a high school audience, as I was just a couple weeks ago, or when I'm talking to the student organization leaders at Youngstown State, where I was two weeks ago, or uh, senior leadership at Ole Miss, where I was last Saturday, I always try to make the point that you need to appeal to people's self-interest. Mahanoy is a great vehicle for reminding folks uh, as Frank Lamonte, former Breckner Center uh, and former head of the Student Press Law Center did in a prescient uh, article he published in Slate just before the court's opinion in Mahanoy. Uh, Mahanoy gives us an opportunity to talk to the high schoolers in your life about why the First Amendment means something and why they should give a damn. Mahanoy involved a cheerleader who went to the Coco Hut on a Saturday night, the Coco Hut being, of course, the local gas station convenience store, and she was pissed off. Uh, and so she and her friend, in a Snapchat that I'm fairly sure she never thought would be seen by all nine justices <laughs> on the court, uh, raised their middle fingers somewhere in the aisle where the snacks and the chips are and the candy bars and said, fuck cheer, fuck school, fuck everything. Now, there's not a single person in here who I think has not felt that sentiment at some point. And certainly, the high school audiences that I talk to, as soon as they hear me curse, they say, wait, this guy's the real deal. And then they, have to pay attention. Uh, you know, they understand that, wait a second, that First Amendment that I've just been talking about, you know, the big one with the perfect letting and kerning behind us, that First Amendment is the thing that also protects them. It's not just a parchment right, as Floyd alluded to, uh, James Madison thinking it might be, it's real. Because the court said that Mahanoy Area High School's suspension of her from the cheerleading squad violated her First Amendment right. The school has no right to reach out into her private life on a Saturday night. They can't stand in place of the parents. You're not under, as Jamil pointed out, you're not under constant surveillance from your public high school. The First Amendment means something, even if you're a high schooler. So what FIRE has been trying to do is weigh in on the lower courts wrestling with uh, Justice Breyer's three factors, right? Uh, how close the proximity it is to school, whether it targets folks at school, uh, whether it's political speech. So long story short, if you're at your grandma's house and you express frustration with the principal, as a case we recently filed, you can check it on our website, www.thefire.org, and you are punished for that post, making fun of your principal, the First Amendment has your back. And that's the message we're here to send. So please go home and tell somebody about it. Nadine Strauss, and I must thank you for your your, your, your heroic defenses of free speech. Over the years, you've seen the campus speech battles evolve in such uh, striking ways. You have a new book coming out about uh, best arguments to protect free speech and uh, rejecting the arguments against it. Um, and, and one of the big arguments that's coming up in the lower courts and on campus is that it's OK to restrict bullying. And this anti-bullying language is being used to uh, violate the Brandenburg standard and allow this suppression of speech. Tell us about this trend and some of the cases you're most concerned about. 
uh, this was actually discussed in one of the earlier panels that in, in addition to the restriction which comes from Brandenburg and we think makes gr a great deal of sense that speech can and should be punished when it imminently, directly causes or threatens certain specific harm, such as violence. Um, students are saying, you know, there is real harm to my psyche and to my emotions from hearing an idea that I find offensive or expression that is insensitive. And it doesn't make any sense for the law not to give me protection. Uh, and on the positive side, these are students who have been brought up in a school and educational environment that teaches them to be respectful, civil toward each other, not to engage in bullying behavior, not to engage in harassing behavior, but to equate harassment and bullying with ideas or words that are upsetting is very dangerous because it means that we are stunting the educational process, right? As a number of other panels have discussed, as Salman Rushdie discussed right at the very beginning, we are never going to be able to develop our understanding, to pursue truth, to pursue any of the aims of free speech, individual self-actualization, let alone be engaged citizens in a democratic republic if we do not listen to others. This was Akilah Mar's great point, um, including the others who may say things that we find offensive. Now, going beyond the free speech justification, uh, in a wonderful book that was co-authored by Will Creeley's boss at FIRE, Greg Lukianoff, and Jonathan Haidt, great social psychologist, The Coddling of the American Mind, um, they point out that even from the point of view of emotional well-being and mental health and psychological well-being, it is detrimental to students to shield them from ideas or expression that is upsetting or, or emotionally harmful. Um, that you may think that you're protecting them, but in the long run, you're doing more harm than good. We have to cultivate resiliency and self-confidence and the ability not to let people undermine our own sense of dignity and self-confidence through words. That's such a crucial point that uh, Greg Lukianoff and Haidt made and it's an answer to the claim that speech is violence. In fact, it's suppression that can cause more psychological harm. Jeannie, Sue Gerson, in your, uh, in, in your wonderful articles for The New Yorker and elsewhere, you've painted this uh, picture about how on campus efforts to suppress speech as violence are now common. You've talked about the growing pressure for trigger warnings and how professors who teach controversial materials are criticized uh, for violence. T t tell us about the form those arguments take. How are they playing out in the courts? And how is it that there's such a disconnect between what the courts say has to be protected and what students are demand be, be demanding be banned? Well, it, you know, it goes back to something that Larissa was saying in the last panel, which is about this conflict between equality and liberty. So one of the things to remember, just even in that, that case, the Mahanoy, situation. You've got the student who engaged in the speech, you've got the school, and sometimes there's another student who is offended, hurt, or feels really just like their dignity has been harmed by the speech of the one student, right? So in that case, it's really the school versus the student because they're criticizing the school, but oftentimes it's not. It is one student and another student, and then the school is kind of in the middle. Now, the reason that these uh, values come into conflict so acutely is because the, because the school also has a bunch of legal responsibilities stemming from federal agencies such as the education department. 
that says to the school, if you don't do certain things proactively or remedially to address dis incidents of discrimination and harassment, then you will be violating federal law, right? So even just the absence of action, just letting it all play out, schools can be in trouble with the government, and that would mean that their federal funding would be at risk. So they have genuine legal responsibilities that they're looking to fulfill, and because we know that lots of bullying and lots of discrimination happens through the spoken word, right, or written word on social media and other kinds of uh, digital um, uh, media, it, it's happening because you're speaking. And so at that point, you are inevitably going to have this conflict. It's not like we can turn around and go, no, there's no real conflict. They really are all compatible all the time. It's not. There really is a conflict between First Amendment or free speech values and the, 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 the value of protecting people and remedying discrimination. Not in every case, but in some of the really hard cases, that does happen. And the school truly, especially in the university setting, is really in that tough spot where they've got the legal obligations on one side and then the um, free speech obligations or the free speech. If it's not a state school, if it's a private school, often the free speech obligations are, feel even less weighty um, compared to the possibility that they're going to be both criticized by their students as not taking discrimination seriously enough and that the government may be breathing down their back. You're, you're so right that there is a genuine conflict. And Will Curry, you flagged some of the post-Mahanoi cases. Uh, students are winning some and losing others. Broadly, are the equality arguments winning in courts, and could you imagine in coming years that uh, the traditional free speech uh, Brandenburg principle might be undermined? You know, I think that the previous panel uh, hit upon this in a way that I'd like to underscore here. The value of history and historical precedent in making clear to students who are, of course, tomorrow's judges and justices and leaders uh, that it protects their rights too. I'm gonna to go back to that appeal to self-interest. When I talk to students, when I was at Youngstown State, I'm talking to all the registered student organizations, and that includes trans students, gay students, who look at me and think, what the hell does the First Amendment do for me? It allows people to bully me. It allows people to say dehumanizing things, to assault my dignity, because Jeannie's absolutely right. This is a real tension. And so I tell them the story of an Eighth Circuit case from the University of Arkansas that happened in the early 80s. I'm 42, I was born in 81. This case arises from events in 1982. So in my lifetime, this involves the Gay and Lesbian Student Association of the University of Arkansas. And they were denied by the student government $200 to show a film about Stonewall. And the reason they were denied is because they were hated. And they were told when they applied for this money, I didn't think you'd look so normal. And why would we give you this money? That'd be like handing matches to an arsonist. The student government was in turn being leaned on by the administration, which was in turn being leaned on by the state legislature. The First Amendment had their back. They filed a federal lawsuit. They won at the Eighth Circuit. That same Eighth Circuit precedent is now relied on by evangelical student groups who say that their rights are being cut off in the name of dignity and quality in high schools and colleges. It interlocks. We litigated a case uh, in conjunction with uh, great folks at Davis Wright Tremaine, two of whom I'm now proud to call colleagues, uh, on behalf of the National Organization for Reform of Marijuana Laws at Iowa State University. Likewise, they were cut off from benefits that other groups had on the basis of viewpoint. The way to reconcile the tension between uh, equality and dignity rights, which are serious and feel intensely personal. I'm not here to say that they aren't real um, or that words uh, can't kick your ass sometimes, because they sure can. But rather, the way to reconcile that tension is by, insist, uh, by insisting that government has no right to place a thumb on either side of the scale. That are some things, as uh, Larissa uh, wisely alluded to, are beyond elections. That there is a common ground. And that common ground is government neutrality in the face of viewpoint uh, preferences, right? V viewpoint neutrality is the way out. Everybody gets treated the same. To me, that's equality, and that's ultimately uh, cognizant of everybody's equal dignity, no matter wh whether you are an evangelical, evangelical Christian uh, or the opposite or whatever, right? It, it protects everybody. That's the point, and that's the message. Beautiful. Viewpoint equality is, uh, viewpoint neutrality is equality. 
Nadine Strassen, many of cases involving suppression of free speech on campus don't go to court. Uh, and uh, just recently, our friend Professor Robbie George, a distinguished conservative scholar, was uh, shouted down, I think, at a college. Tell us of that story and how more broadly um, administrations responding to efforts to shout down uh, unpopular speakers are suppressing free speech. Well, FIRE has been tracking deplatforming, uh, as it's called, at campuses across the country for a number of years. The trends are very concerning. Um, before I talk about this incident involving such a prominent scholar very recently, let me say, Jeff, that FIRE just came out with, together with College Pulse uh, a few days ago the fourth annual survey of student attitudes toward free speech, and this is very disturbing. This is really the nut that all of us say we have to crack because ultimately support for freedom of speech depends on the public, right? Uh, as Learned Hand said, it, it lives in, in, or dies in the hearts of men or women. And the younger generation, as has been alluded to, has some negative attitudes. Uh, the survey, which covered 248 campuses, it's the largest ever, 55,000 students, uh, very granular questions. Uh, I believe it was 49% uh, set did support blocking fellow students from hearing a speaker in at least some circumstances. Um, so. I think we can um, anticipate that these problems are going to continue. Robert George, who is a very respected, mainstream, conservative, uh, politically conservative, religiously conservative scholar, a political scientist at Princeton University, who has ironically been such a paragon of free speech. Many of you may have had the privilege of seeing some of the colloquies he has engaged in with Cornell West, who could not be more different ideologically. And the two of them epitomize everything that we've been extolling about speaking with and listening to and dialoguing with somebody whose views are different and how beneficial that can be to you and to your understanding and how illuminating it is. Uh, to the audience. To add to the irony, Professor George was discussing how the purpose of a university, the mission of a university, is truth-seeking. It was a titled lecture uh, that he had been invited to give at Washington College in Maryland. And partway through the remarks, uh, disruptive students entered chanting and um, blowing whistles and playing certain musical instruments, making it impossible for him to be heard. And I think we haven't alluded to this yet, that the First Amendment includes not only the right of a speaker to convey information and ideas, but the right of the audience members to hear information and ideas. That was thwarted. And most disturbingly, the reports are that neither the campus police nor university officials, including the president, who was in the audience, did anything to prevent the disruption. So the event was, uh, was canceled. Uh, Jeannie Sue Gerson, um, administrators have demonstrated a range of responses to shout down efforts uh, ranging from the principled response of the dean of Stanford Law School uh, to disruptions there to examples like the one Nadine just mentioned. You are uh, a leader in the Academic Freedom Alliance, which is trying to combat this behavior. Tell us how you're trying to do that and how administrators uh, can do better. OK, so I think that um, it's, this is a complicated area mainly because we want to protect the right to protest and to dissent and to object and to speak out about things you find morally offensive, right? We want students to be able to do that. So if they're going to do that by um, coming to an event 
and making their views known and holding up signs and you know, doing all kinds of things to make sure that their message gets across and to really tell the speaker how much they disapprove. That should be protected, both under the First Amendment and by school rules protecting the freedom of expression. Now, when that crosses over into the line of being so disruptive that the event cannot go on, that people cannot speak, that people cannot hear, that's the line that at, at a university with the educational mission that we have, that we don't want that line to be crossed. And if it is crossed, it must have a consequence if we're really going to hold to it. But this is also difficult because the area of discipline, of disciplining students, punishing them with things like expulsion, suspension, um, that is historically associated with repression of free speech and free expression and freedom of thought. That's what universities did against student protesters, right? And giving them, you know, giving them punishments and telling them they, that they would be kicked out of school. That's the kind of thing that is associated with repressive um, regimes and also with repressive schools. And so I think that this becomes a very tricky area, and that's why you see schools be reluctant when students are disrupting events to actually step in and say, we're gonna call the police or you're going to go before the ad board and have to defend yourself, and if you've broken a school rule, then you're gonna to have to be punished, just like someone who committed plagiarism or stole a computer, right? So I think that that's been a very difficult line for schools, and um, I will just say, I, I teach at Harvard Law School. I think at Harvard Law School, we have been very clear about where that line is. We have. You know, to, in order to be fair about it, you have to give everyone notice at the beginning of the year. Students have to be very clear um, that they're going to be violating a school rule when they go beyond a certain point um, in their protest, where the protest turns into um, activity that is prohibited, that we no longer consider protest, we consider it disruption. Um, and you ha the school has to be willing to actually act on it and discipline people and enforce, and actually suspend. And I think a lot of schools are not there yet. So true about the importance of being clear and being willing to discipline people who break the rules and also the dangers of suppressing protests because you disagree with them. And we have in the exhibit Mary Beth Tinker's black armband. She's mm -hmm. lent it to us. Yeah. And there's a picture of her when she was a young kid sitting next to a civil rights protester who first used yeah. the, civil, the black armband and then she uh, just a few years later, adopted it to protest the Vietnam War. Let's talk now about the um, speech interests of professors. And Will um, Creeley Fire is representing Professor Stephen Kirshner at SUNY, a devil's advocate who was on the podcast talking about the morality of age of consent laws. His, his case was just written up in the New York Times. And there are other professors who have been fired for their speech, including those who have criticized um, diversity statements, a, a phenomenon the New York Times also recently wrote up. Tell us about those cases. Yeah, where do we start? How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> I want to uh, be somewhat careful with my comments on Kirshner. Uh, as you note in the New York Times article today, we declined to comment, and that's because my colleagues right now uh, are in a hotel room in my hometown of Buffalo, New York, preparing for uh, their evidentiary hearing tomorrow. So <laughs> I will encourage folks to check out our website again, thefire.org. Uh, what we've seen in recent years are professors singled out for dissenting views or controversial views on matters of public concern and punished uh, for those views. One shocking case uh, that my colleague Greg Grubel is in the audience uh, litigated successfully, uh, the case of uh, Dr. Laura Burnett at Collin College who criticized Vice President Pence uh, during the 2020 vice presidential debate, uh, the one with the fly, folks will remember that perhaps, <laughs> uh, and uh, said, someone tell this, uh, this uh, guy to shut his little demon mouth up. And she didn't realize it, but Twitter being what it is, uh, for good and for ill, boon and bane, uh, the visibility of her tweet meant that her local Republican uh, state legislator saw it and, as we found out later, sent a text message to the president of Collin College in Texas and said, she's on the payroll, right? And he received a response from the president of the university saying something like, I'll handle it. 
sure enough, they handled it, right? <laughs> they effectively terminated her. So we litigated. And I could go on, I, we've only got 15 minutes, folks. I could go on for a solid three hours with stories like uh, Laura Bur Burnett's from both sides of the ideological aisle. And for some folks who are frankly like uh, Professor Kirshner, just uh, ideological gadflies or classic Socratic protagonists who want to say, well, why do we think that's bad? Let's talk about it. Let's see what we can figure out about morality by asking questions about deeply held convictions that we have as a society. Academic freedom should protect all of that. And that's why we're litigating in uh, federal court. We have a, our appeal. We won a preliminary injunction against Florida's Stop Woke Act, which listed eight concepts that teachers were not allowed to, quote unquote, advance in a college classroom. The college classroom should be precisely the place where we have those debates. These were Governor DeSantis' brainchild. They were designed to target, quote unquote, woke viewpoints. In um, California right now, we're also uh, in federal court with a new lawsuit because California community colleges now have uh, adopted an evaluatory framework, an evaluation framework for professors that measures their commitment and teaching of anti-racist principles. Now again, no matter what you think of, quote unquote, woke or, quote unquote, anti-racist principles, those things should be hotly debated in our public college campuses. That's the whole idea. You start the knowledge generating machine, then you back away slowly if you're a legislator. You don't get to push and poke and say, well, now we're a blue state, so we're gonna say you can't talk about red state things or vice versa. So yeah, we're, we're working hard to, <laughs> to protect academic freedom, but it's a full-time job. It, it is indeed, and it's so urgently important, as you just said, that you are defending academic freedom against threats from the right in forms of the Anti-Woke Act and from the left in terms of those who would um, punish those who failed to pledge allegiance to a particular diversity statement or a particular dogma. Nadine Strossen, tell us more about the threats on both sides. Are those refusals to pledge allegiance to diversity statements a form of compelled speech? And uh, do you think that the threats on this count are coming more from the right or the left, or are they on both sides? Uh, definitely the threats are coming from across the ideological spectrum, including a persistent phenomenon that each side, and I hate to use the word sides because I see all of us as part of a continuum, but many of us see ourselves in tribes, and each tribe is happy to complain about censorship that's coming from the other side, but not willing to recognize that they too are engaging in it. And Jeff, if I could say, to me, the greatest threat to free speech on campus is coming from students themselves because they are afraid of their fellow students. The peer pressure is so enormous. The latest Fire and College Pulse survey showed that, you know, this is so pervasive that even the schools that had the best free speech culture because the administration was relatively enlightened, the policies were relatively enlightened, there was almost no difference between the top schools and the bottom schools in terms of student self-censorship. Uh, and that self-censorship, I was really startled to see, comes not only in the classroom, but also in individual conversations with faculty members, also in conversations with other students. 25% or so across the board said that they either very often or quite often are engaging in self-censorship. And the survey had a very specific definition that you fear punishment, either legal punishment or social punishment uh, or even physical attack. So it was a very specific definition. And the most concerning to me as an educator, 25% of students across the board at the time that they answered these surveys, they were enrolled in college. Many of them had been there for a number of years, but all for at least a semester that they are engaging in more self-censorship now than when they began college. So the exact opposite of what we would expect and hope for, that the college experience would be something that would free your mind, that would free your tongue, um, that would open you to speaking and to listening. Uh, and that's not happening, unfortunately. 
It is tragic to hear that truth, and it's so important that you remind us that self-censorship and the fear of uh, uh, offending the conformity of, of the mob is perhaps the greatest threat to speech. Confirming John Stuart Mill's warning that the threats to speech would come less from government than from the, the tyranny of, of social opinion. Jeannie Souk, how are you seeing that self-censorship and fear of conventional disapproval manifesting itself on campus, and what can be done about it? So unfortunately, Harvard University, I think, may have come in dead last oh, in, yes. the, in the fire um, <laughs> rankings of schools. Um, and there's, you know, we, we've internally had some debates about your methodology, but, <laughs> but be that as it may, um, I, what I am seeing, and I'll, I'll now speak in the first person as a teacher, uh, I'm a constitutional law professor. I also teach criminal law. Those are two topics in which you, know, you run the gamut of con controversial issues, um, everything from abortion to affirmative action to you know, the civil rights movement. And in, in criminal law, you've got the death penalty. You've got all kinds of uh, sexual assault. Um, all of the different topics that students generally today would tend to associate with the danger of getting emotionally harmed in a conversation. If someone were to say something that, were, that they would find offensive, hurtful, you know, like denying their own identity, something like that. So those are, that's just my daily teaching experience. That's what I'm doing every day. Um, I would say I began teaching in 2007. And um, in the years that I've been teaching, everything has changed about the classroom environment. And um, I now no longer rely on volunteers at all um, in my classroom discussions because that's just no way to get a, a robust debate or e any kind of a diversity of viewpoints. You might get like diversity from here to here, whereas you would want, you know, you want you would want a wider range of views represented um, in the classroom. You can't get that by saying, okay, who, who's gonna volunteer to say something? And mainly because of the fear, um, you get a lot of, you know, well, I don't think this, but some, you know, some conservatives might think this. Um, you get a lot of that, a lot of distancing. And then um, I think a lot of, um, I, I've had times when, you know, in, in the law schools, you, you know, you. We are, you know, our legal system is an adversarial legal system, at least in the courts. And so there is inherently a notion of there being more than one side that you would have to listen to. But on campuses today, if you say the phrase both sides, it is inherently coded as either conservative or making excuses for views that are either racist or discriminatory, right? That if you say the phrase both sides, um, that will lose a large portion of your student audience. Um, and yet, our job as legal educators is to teach students to argue at least two sides of an issue. And so I've had the experience of saying, okay, here's uh, this case, Lawrence versus Texas, you're, gonna, you're going to say Justice Kennedy's view in, in your own words in the best way you can, and you're gonna say Justice Scalia's view yeah. in the best way that you can, and you know, Usually that exercise goes beautifully, it does, but then you will get the students afterwards who would say, I felt really traumatized by having to listen to that, having to, having to have you, I mean, you laugh, but it's, this is like really serious. I mean, this is just, you know, I, I want to, you know, I want the professor to know, and they'll go to my teaching fellows and say, I want the professor to know she can never do that again, and she can never call on me to, say a viewpoint that I might not agree with, and I won't have her ever call on me again for any issue having to do with LGBT, um, you know, whatever, whatever it is. So you have students saying those kinds of things, and I think that with faculty, in this environment, many of them can feel scared to actually stand their ground and say, this is how I teach and I do this for a reason. I feel lucky, despite buyers, you know, views to the contrary, I feel lucky to teach at a school, Harvard Law School, where I know that the administration will have my back on matters of academic freedom in the classroom and pedagogy, right? It would never be a situation for me, I feel confident, where 
if I, you know, if I, next year, if I said, okay, what's Justice Scalia's view on this, then somehow I'm going to be hauled in and like disciplined or investigated for something. I unfortunately think a lot of teachers across the country would not feel the same way. Um, and it does depend sort of administration by administration. Harvard Law School may be different from the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, may be different from the medical school or the School of Public Health. So I, I, unfortunately right now, we're, we have a little bit of a training gap in terms of university administrators. Mm. They've, in the last 10 years, gotten a lot of training and a lot of like, you know, raising their intelligence and their um, expertise about matters of discrimination and making people feel like they belong that may not have traditionally felt like they've done a lot of that. But now it's time also to put in the academic freedom piece of it. That what diversity means is not just diversity in terms of your race or your ethnicity or your gender or gender identity, but also diversity of viewpoints. That is, that is in, at the end of the day, when you talk about diversity, they're all there to, because they embody different experiences and may have different views, and that is what you're gonna learn from. And I think that we've, you know, University of Lost Sight have lost sight of what the purpose of diversity is, even while worshiping diversity. Yep. Exactly right, exactly right. That's an extraordinarily important warning and a cautionary tale. I'm, I'm teaching constitutional law this term and I'm also asking students to state the majority opinion and state the dissent. You don't have to say which one you agree with, but just the, the skill of learning how to articulate uh, both sides is crucial to learning con law. And I have not experienced the, the pushback that you have, but it's, it's very sobering. We have just, uh, two minutes left and uh, we must end on time because it's been uh, a, a remarkable series of panels. I, I, I hope it's okay. I'm gonna just take the um, privilege of, of moderating this discussion to end with the words of Louis Brandeis because whenever I think about what I wanna teach to young people and pe learners of all ages, they're encapsulated by his statement in Whitney. I can recite it now as a party trick, so, so here it is. <laughs> This is Brandeis, and he's just been reading Jefferson, uh, his bill for establishing religious freedom, and he's tracking Jefferson's arguments. He says, those who won our revolution, the people in Independence Hall over there, those who won our revolution believe that the final end of the state was to make men free to develop their faculties, and that in its government, the deliberative forces should prevail against the arbitrary. They valued liberty both as an end and as a means. They believe liberty to be the secret of happiness and courage to be the secret of liberty. That's from Pericles' funeral oration. They believe that freedom to think as you will and speak as you think, that's from Tac Tacitus, are means indispensable to the discovery and spread of political truth. That without free speech and assembly, discussion would be futile. That with them, Discussion affords ordinarily adequate protection against the dissemination of noxious doctrine, that the greatest threat to freedom is an inert people, that public discussion is a political duty, and that this should be a fundamental principle of the American government. That just sums it up in these beautiful words, and I am so grateful to our extraordinary scholars for having come across America to educate us about the First Amendment and let the shining light of reason that we have beamed forth today inspire all of us to defend free speech in the years ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff. That was great. That was excellent. Hey, thanks. Oh, great. <laughs>